You probably noticed the weekly said Pastor Dale is going to be teaching today, and that was the plan until about 9.30 last night. And <laughs> apparently he found a way to get the chicken pox. So, you know, he's got that baby immune system from the bone marrow transplant and kind of crazy. But anyway, that's where we're at. So you get me. My name's Les. I'm one of the elders here. If you've been here very long, you see me at the soundboard a lot. So please stand with me as we read our text. We're in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for the opportunity to come together around your word, Lord. We thank you for this time of fellowship with the saints. Lord, we look forward to what your spirit has for us this morning. And we just give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated, please. Thank you. So I'm going to hit you with all kinds of stuff this morning. Lucky for me, I was getting ready for a message next week. So uh, we're going to start off with a little history pop quiz. This is going to see, I'm going to see if you can name that quote. Um, You know, great historical figures are often remembered by their powerful quotations. So let's see if you recognize any of these. First one, and I wish I could do impressions because this would be way more fun, but um, give me liberty or give me death. Right on. Oh, we have a teacher. (laughs) Ha (laughs) ha ha. Yep, the American Revolution. I have nothing to fear, or we have nothing to fear but fear itself. FDR, right on. You guys must have done good in school. (laughs) Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do. Yep, Kennedy. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I am proud of you guys. Man, this is awesome. The last one is a dead giveaway. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yep, that was Joshua in the plains of Shechem. But isn't it interesting how you hear a quote, and if you're like me, I mean, I can actually almost hear the, the, the newsreel thing going on in my head. So Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15 There are two statements in that little piece of scripture that I really want to drill into a little bit. Uh, The first one's right at the beginning of verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And the other one is right at the end, the last sentence in verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So my first key point, God is awesome. How hard is that, huh? But if you think about it, um, you know, this, we start out, now therefore fear the Lord. So what is a healthy fear of the Lord all about? I can tell you what it is not. It is not like a, a cowering in the corner, afraid of being hit for something you did or didn't do. Um, if you're like me, that is probably the definition, that the, the thing that pops into your head the most when you think fear. Uh, The Oxford Dictionary has a definition for fear, and it has a whole list of possible choices, but an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. And again, I don't know why, but that's when you say fear, that's kind of what pops into my head. That is not at all what the biblical concept of fearing the Lord is about. Uh, One commentary said it this way, Uh, To fear the Lord is to be in awe of his holiness, to give him complete reverence and to honor him as the God of great glory, majesty, purity, and power. I mean, that's the God we serve. That is what his character deserves. God is awesome. So when you just begin to grasp even a little bit who God is, who who the Bible says he is, we should be filled with awe. I mean, when you think awe, think words like wonder, adoration, amazement, 
we should be filled with reverence, think words like respect and worship. We should want to honor him. I mean, he so totally deserves it. Key point two, God deserves our time and attention. I'm gonna dig into this one a little bit. So what does it mean to serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness? Let's start off by thinking about how we spend our days. Uh, and I'm gonna go way back, Genesis, in the beginning, right? Uh, let's define what a day is. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. He called the, the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning, the first day. How's that for an awesome God? He spoke it, and it was so. So there was evening, there was morning, the first day, the beginning of time as we know it. Ever since then, the Lord has deposited, get this, the Lord has deposited 86,400 seconds on the clock each and every day. I did the math. Yes, I am an engineering geek, sorry. But, so let's think about that. Those precious seconds are yours to spend as you wish. You can spend them carefully or carelessly. You can spend them wisely or waste them. So how will you spend them? How do you spend them? Do you invest your time in relationships? Or do you spend your, all your time at work? And I'll confess to you, in my career, I probably spent way too much time and energy in the working part and not as much time and energy in the relationship part. So, Let's say you're more noble than me and you decided to invest in relationships, and obviously there's lots of ways you could spend your time, but let's say you decided to invest in relationships. What kind of relationships do you choose? Are you a person who it's all about your friends? You, you, know, all, you just invest all your time and energy in your friends? Or do you spend a little bit of time with your family? Hopefully that's true. What about Jesus? Where does he fit into that scheme? So this is where I'm counting on you as we go through this conversation here, and I guess it's kind of one way, but um, to, that you're going to think about how do you actually spend your time, and is it the way you should be? So whether or not you are intentional about how you're spending your time, you're constantly deciding what to do with your time. Those seconds appear one at a time, tick, 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 and in a flash, they're gone. You can't save them for tomorrow. Once it's gone, it's gone. You can't, it's kind of like manna, right? You know, God gave the Israelites manna. They could collect it on that day, that day only. It was only good for that long, and then it would rot. Well, you know, for us, a second is a second, and then it's gone. Time is really kind of an interesting thing when you think about it. I mean, a second is always a second, but sometimes it can seem like forever. I mean, I can remember sitting in class, you know, about time for school to get out for summer, and I'll tell you what, that clock, it might have been ticking, but it was ticking slow. Or on the other side of it, um, you know, sometimes time can seem to just vanish. Again, I, from my own experience, if I'm really studying something, I'm really focused on something, I can, two hours can be gone and I have no idea. So I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard the saying that time is money. I would suggest that time is more valuable than money. Because if you can think about it, you probably can get more money, but you can't get more time. I mean, you, you have what you have, and that's it. Of course, eternity with the Lord is better than time or money, right? That's why we need to believe in Jesus. So I'd like you to think about how you're spending your time. Are you spending your seconds wisely? Are you investing in them in ways that serve the Lord in sincerity, and in faithfulness? Or are you chasing temporal things, finite things, things in the world? And really the most important decision, the most important question is, does your heart seek the things of God or are you being enticed by the things of the world? Really, that's, that's the primary thing. You're, you're, if your heart's desire is to seek God, you're in a good place. And I think that's basically the challenge that Joshua was presenting to the people of Israel. He was asking them, are you going to serve the true and living God or not? 
can you, you can't have one foot in and one foot out. Uh, you can't serve two masters. Then there's, you know, as a leader, as Joshua, as their leader, takes a clear stand. He leaves no doubt at all. He says, me and my house will serve the Lord. Before we jump to the last sentence of the section, let's look at the stuff in the middle. So Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. You know, if you'll remember... Uh, God chose Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, and then you know, Moses led them around in the desert for 40 years. And God repeatedly told Moses uh, that Israel must not, capital letters, bold underline, must not mix with the people in the lands that they were going to possess. And why is that? Well, God knows his creation very well. He knows what we're going to do. Um, because he knew that if they intermarried with the current inhabitants of the land, uh, they would be led astray to worshiping other gods, little g-gods, you know, idols, basically. So what did they do when they did enter the land of Josh with Joshua? So Joshua ends up relieving Moses as the leader at, before they go into the land. And now this is going to be toward the end of Joshua's life when he's having this conversation with Israel. But um, when they entered the land with Joshua... They drove out some of the inhabitants of the land, but they didn't drive out all of them. And sure enough, they intermarried and mixed with the, the people of the land, and they began to worship their gods. Even though, even though the Lord had proven himself faithful to them over and over and over. Even though he had delivered them out of the land of Egypt. I mean, the, 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 the God, the, the powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing God, had delivered them from all kinds of things, and they still wandered to pay attention to other things. So right now you're probably wondering, what has this got to do with me serving him in sincerity and faithfulness? Well, I'm glad you asked. So my key point number three is, put away the distractions in your life so that you can spend more time focusing on Jesus. I mean, you and I may not be worshiping the sorts of idols that they were, but we are faced with a similar decision. You know, will you, will we serve the one and only true and living God? Or will we give our time and attention to other things? And I'll tell you, it's easy to give your time and attention to other things. So what, I mean, what is an idol really? It, it's something that you elevate above God in your life. So Joshua called the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and this is basically his public farewell to them. And he had a couple of concerns. He wanted to remind them, here is what you're, you should be doing. Here's where your heart should be. And if you're not there, you're going to have to make a choice. And there will be consequences that come with that choice. He challenged them to renew their commitment to the Lord. And he challenged them to renew the covenant that was made between the Lord and, and Moses at uh, Mount Sinai. And then as this section goes on after the couple of um, verses that we're reading... Um, he, it turns out that they, if they decline to do this, he tells them they've got to decide who they will serve, whether it's the pagan gods of Egypt, Canaan, and Mesopotamia, or if um, they're you know, going to serve the one, the one and true God. Um, he's, he's trying to make them face the practical reality of their behavior. Again, this morning, I'm going to challenge you with a similar decision. You know, if you haven't accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, if you're here and you're not saved, you don't know Jesus, now is the time. I mean, you don't know how many seconds you have left, really. I didn't know, you know, three years ago I had an aortic dissection, and for you who are not medical, I'll tell you what that's about. You've got this garden hose-sized artery that comes up out of your heart and run, you know, runs up, does a loop and goes down your body. Mine, instead of being however big a garden hose is, five-eighths of an inch or something, had ballooned to about two inches or so and started tearing the valve on the top of my heart. And, and, and in addition to that, this, this hose has got three layers in it, 
And so it dissected, when it got so big, it dissected and split that, sent that inside layer. So that basically the whole length of my body gets dissected. You know, all of that to just tell you, I didn't know that was coming. I thought life was great. My, you know, we had a good fellowship here in the church. Um, things seemed like they were just going to keep going like they have been going. And then just like that, I'm in the hospital and I'm having open heart surgery. Um, praise God. You know, he brought me through it when less than one in five people who deal with this situation don't make it. Um, who knew Dale was going to get chicken pox? I mean, you know, um, <laughs> You just, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Sometimes it's big things, sometimes it's little things, but you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So, if you're a Christian here, you know, that was for, for if you're not a Christian, I really encourage you, make it today. Talk to the person you came with, come talk to me, talk to one of the elders here, but don't leave without making the decision. If you're a Christian here, how are you spending your seconds? If someone took an inventory of how you spend your time, what would they conclude about your priorities? Is, is, would it be clear that Jesus is very important to you, uh, then family, then work and other stuff? Or would it look like maybe the priorities were shifted around? Um, balance is important. You know, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly in John 10.10. Jesus also said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. That was Matthew 6, 33. So he knows what we need. He knows, you know, we, we live our lives here. Um, we, he is to be number one, and then we, uh, we've got other things, we've got other responsibilities that we need to take care of. I'm just asking you, check your balance. You know, have the Holy Spirit help you check your balance. Are you spending your time enough in the right areas? Again, Joshua left no doubt when he was talking to Israel. Um, he boldly declares that he and his family will serve the Lord. I actually have a little plaque next to my front door uh, that has this little verse on it. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And it actually is a good reminder as I come and go, just because I see it all the time, uh, that that is what I should be focused on. But it's also tended to be a good conversation starter occasionally when people come up to the door and they, oh, I see, you know, they start to ask you questions. At any rate, uh, it is, it's a good little thing for me to have that plaque on the front door. So Joshua boldly declared that they will serve the Lord. The people say uh, they will do the same. However, <laughs> Joshua warns them that if they make the decision lightly, that will not be good because they, if they go back to serving their idols, it will turn out badly for them and it will turn out badly for Israel in general. So as Christians... You know, instead of don't make the decision lightly, we would say count the cost. Uh, what is that cost? You know, you, you have to give up your sinful ways of your BC days right before Christ, the things that you used to do and enjoy, um, sometimes the friends that you used to hang out with. It doesn't mean that all fun stops, but you need to think about how you spend your time a little differently. So Joshua's speech was uh, really just a loud and clear call to repent and recommit themselves to the Lord. So my first point of application is realize that it begins with you. You know, when I say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, or we will serve the Lord, I have to know that it starts with me. I lead the way. Where I am will set the stage for where my kids and grandkids will end up. I mean, it doesn't necessarily determine what happens to them, but it sure influences the kinds of decisions that they will ultimately make in their lives. And what am I doing with my time? Who am I privately? Um, if I watch questionable stuff on TV, you know, can I expect my kids not to do the same? And you might be thinking, oh, my kids don't know what I'm watching. I'll tell you, it's been just shocking to me watching my grandkids grow up. I seem to be more aware with them than I was with my kids, but... Uh, they don't miss a thing. And so uh, they probably are more aware of what's going on than you might think. Not to mention that God knows, right? I mean, he knows everything that happens whenever, wherever you are. So in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said that the Father sees what you do in secret and will reward you. And in that particular piece of scripture, 
he's giving us, um, using the, the needy, giving to the needy as an illustration. Uh, the point, though, is that the Lord pays attention to what we do in secret. Do we do what we do for our glory? Or do we do what we do out of obedience to him? You know, what, what's our motivation for the things that we choose to do, the things that we choose to spend our time on? Let me read uh, Matthew 6, the first few verses to you. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. It isn't about you. It's about the Lord, right? Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So, if you want your sons and daughters to be Bible lovers, be a Bible lover yourself. You know, develop a deep devotional life, personally and privately. If you want your kids to be pure, be pure in your private life, in your secret life. I mean, what you do in secret will inevitably impact what your kids and grandkids end up doing. You know, dads, I mean, I'm a dad, grandpa, that's kind of where my head goes a lot, but this applies to more than that. But you know, your kids and grandkids will tend to copy what you see, or what they see you do, um, or what they hear you do, for that matter. My, <laughs> My grandkids have said things that wasn't I who said them, but someone there around did. Um, but, I mean, they will copy the things that they see and do, hear you do, but they'll also, they will really be impacted by who you are. And that who you are is a very deep-seated thing that you're transmitting all the time, whether you realize it or not. Um, think about it. Um, what, what message are they receiving from you? I mean, Christians, are they, what message are your unbelieving friends receiving from you? I mean, words, words transmit some meaning, but the tone of your voice, the inflection in your voice, uh, the body language, there are lots of ways that there's a whole lot more information going out than you realize. What, what sorts of things do you react to? What sorts of things do you let slide? I mean, that says a lot about what's really in your head, too. Are you consistent? Are you a do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do kind of person sometimes? For better or for worse, our kids and grandkids especially are going to follow in our footsteps. And those, those unbelievers who watch us do these crazy things are going to think we're hypocrites. So, you know, you, you are, people are watching you whether you think so or not. The other thing with respect to, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, is boldly declare it. I mean, are you, are you a closet Christian? Do people have trouble figuring out whether you're really a Christian or not? Or do you act like you are who you say you are, that you believe what you say you believe? There's a section of scripture in Matthew 12 uh, where Jesus is addressing a crowd of people. And someone notices that his family is out in the crowd somewhere and they're wanting to see him. And so let's take a look at the passage. It's Matthew 12, verses 48 to 50. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, the people, or still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward the disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So as Christians, that is us. We are his family. I mean, that's the most amazing thing. We are adopted brothers and sisters of Christ. We are his house, right? The Bible tells us we are his body, the church. The building is great. I am very thankful for the building, but we are his body, the church. You know, Jesus served his Father perfectly. None of us could do that. And that gives me hope. Why? Well, I realized that even if I drop the ball, when I drop the ball, when I mess up, I'm in the house of the one who never fails. 
Even if I'm faithless, he will be faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So here's an example to demonstrate that point. You remember the section of scripture where Jesus has told the disciples somebody will betray him, and Peter, you know, bold Peter says, Lord, even though everyone else forsakes you, I won't. I'll, I'll die beside you. And then, of course, we know that by the time the rooster crows, he's denied the Lord three times. So after Jesus rose from the dead, what did he do? He went and found Peter and said, do you love me? Peter had denied Jesus three times. Jesus asked him, do you love me three times? Now, he used three different words for love, do you love me? But my point is this. At the end of the discussion, Jesus says, Peter, feed my lambs. Jesus is telling Peter, you are not disqualified. It's a new day. Get back in the fight. So whatever mistakes you've made, if you've got Jesus, you're forgiven. Repentance is required, but you're forgiven. And Jesus can and will use you if you let him. So be a Christ-like example. Again, going back to what Joshua said. <clears throat> As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As the leader of Israel, Joshua was setting the example. I mean, each of us have to make the same choice that he was challenging the Israelites to make. If you're a leader of your family, you set the tone. If you're a leader of a business, you set the tone. If you're the leader of a sports team, whatever it is, if, wherever you are, you're probably a leader of some sort. You set the tone for the people around you. To be an effective leader, our actions need to be consistent with what we say. I mean, why should anybody follow you if you, know, you don't do what you say? The Apostle Paul told people to follow his example as he followed Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That is a bold statement. In fact, every time I read that, I go, man, how can you dare say something like that? I don't want to follow in me, I want to follow in him. But he, he did a good job of following the Lord. Um, and as you know, he was before his BC days, he was actually persecuting Christians. So, I mean, again, what does that say? You're not done if you've made mistakes. But make sure the example that you're setting is Christ-like, whether you're at home or at work or whatever you do. Whether or not you're technically in a leader position, leadership position, your words and actions impact the people around you. And your impact's probably bigger than you think. I've had many cases where I have had a conversation with somebody and I didn't give it a second thought. And then weeks or months or even years later, I end up circling back around with that person and they were really impacted by some, what I thought was some simple little thing. So what you do matters. Be confident in the Lord. That's my fourth application point. Um, Hebrews 11:6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So seek God as you lead your family or business or whatever you do. Maybe I shouldn't turn that way. <laughs> it rings when I go that way. Uh, in your leadership role, you need to be able to say, I have faith that God will do what he promised to do. I mean, again, demonstrate your faith. So what has God promised? There are a couple of quotes that I want to give you that actually Paul wrote under the inspiration of Holy Spirit. Um, Philippians 1, verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that encouraging? 2 Timothy 1, 12, I know whom I have believed. <clears throat> I don't know why this chokes me up. <clears throat> so 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced 
that he is able to guard until that day, what he's entrusted to me. So have faith. So let me wrap it up here. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Realize that it begins with you. Boldly declare it. Be a Christ-like example. Be confident in the Lord. And since I've given you a history quiz and I've demonstrated some math skills, I thought I'd give you some homework. So Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So the particular thing was money in that passage. I think Joshua was putting forth a similar challenge to Israel. He wasn't saying you can't serve God and money necessarily, but he was saying you can't serve God and any of these other idols. So, my challenge for you, think about this. You cannot serve God and fill in the blank. Is there something in that blank that you need to deal with? I mean, the Holy Spirit, that's, that's between you and the Holy Spirit, but just something to think about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the joy and the peace that come from knowing you. Lord, you are so amazing, so, so beyond what we can really even comprehend. And Lord, I thank you that you call us out of the world. You give us the opportunity to choose you. I thank you that even if we stumble, you can still use us. So Lord, I just, uh, I pray that this message has touched the hearts of someone here. Lord, that uh, today will be the day of salvation for someone here. And Lord, that, that we will just go out and kind of renew our commitment to you, our uh, desire to serve you and uh, help us to maintain balance between the various things that pull at our time and attention and the most important thing, which is Jesus. Lord, we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.